Okay, welcome to this week's episode of Washington Policy on the Go. My name is Donald Kimball. I'm the communications manager here at Washington Policy Center. Today, we've got a great program. We are going to be talking to our Center for Small Business Director, Mark Harmsworth, as well as our Center for Education Director, Leave Finna, both of whom have just uh, released new publications that are very topical. We've got a publication from Mark on affordable housing and what ways uh, our housing system right now is not affordable and ways we can improve that, as well as uh, Leave, who's created a publication on myths about school choice. As we see across the nation, school choice is very much in the forefront of education talks. And so there's a lot of negative press around that. And so Leave addresses a lot of the common misperceptions around that. And so she's going to talk to us about that. Before we start talking with Mark, though, just want to remind you if you miss an episode of this, uh, we're doing them weekly now. So if you miss an episode or can't make one, as a reminder, we upload these to our YouTube channel. And this is also available um, as a podcast. So if you have a podcast app or platform you like to use, you can look up Washington Policy on the go and catch up there or uh, stay stay up to date with that. And then also make sure to visit our website at WashingtonPolicy.org. We post all of our latest studies as well as a wealth of blogs. Our researchers are just constantly writing, keeping everyone up to date on things going on in po the policy world, especially as we are in the middle of the legislative session. There's a lot going on and uh, the, the blog is constantly updated multiple posts a day, it feels like. So definitely visit our website there and sign up for our mailing list because we will send you the latest there. So without further ado, I'm going to bring on Mark uh, to talk about, about his new study on housing. Uh, so thanks so much for being here, Mark. Well, thanks for having me on today, Donald. I really appreciate it. You're looking very fine this Tuesday. Th thank you so much. You know, I'm, I'm repping my Young Professionals uh, t-shirt here because of our Young Professionals group at Washington Policy Center, which is a great group. So anyone uh, that's what I was thinking. that should check that out too. Exactly right. Yeah. So, um, you know, let's let's not beat around the bush. Washington's housing uh, situation is not super affordable right now. Um, being a first time home homeowner recently myself, I found that out kind of the hard way. Um, when it when it comes to the affordable nature of houses and stuff, one of the things in your latest study that you point to a lot is the Growth Management Act. And uh, just to bring us all up to date, what is this? And give us some context. Uh, about when it was passed and those kinds of things. Right. Well, back in 1990, the uh, legislature uh, was looking around the country at the way different cities were growing. And if you imagine the L.A. pictures that you always see with freeways of six lanes wide and each direction, and they didn't want the same to happen here in Washington. We have um, limited geography on the west side of the mountains, obviously, because we're pinched between the water and the mountains. Um, and so they were trying to come up with a way of uh, both protecting the environment and allowing growth to happen at a, at a reasonable rate. Um, and so uh, they passed the Growth Management Act. Um, and uh, what it has done, though, over the last 30 or 40, uh, 30 years here is um, actually decrease the amount of available housing. So the very thing it was supposed to do, which was sort of help with housing and, and control growth, What's actually happened is it's limited growth and then driven up the cost of housing. And it's not the only thing that's done that. Obviously, we've seen a, a huge influx of uh, tech workers that uh, make really good salaries, and that's driven up the price of housing. But it's it's basic demand and supply. When, when you don't have enough homes, the cost of what you do have goes up both in the value of um, the, the house that you're buying and rents as well, because those uh, rental properties and, and the majority of rental properties in Washington state are owned by um, folks that's not big corporations. It's maybe their first home that they're renting out and they've, they've managed to save and, and get into a second home and they're renting out their first home. So they, they're still maybe got a loan on that as well. And so they're renting it to pay that loan off. So that's why you see pressure both in the rental and in the actual housing market itself. And the Growth Management Act um, is not helping us at this point. It it is definitely restricting things, um, and uh, it uh, it's driven. And I'll throw this in there without trying to get too in depth into all the population stuff. But this uh, this is organization called the Puget Sound Regional Council, which is a, a federally created organization that's supposed to do regional planning. And what's happening with the Puget Sound Regional Council is it does 
uh, population growth targets for specific areas. So you can imagine if you live in Salton or Arlington, your growth targets for population infill are significantly lower than maybe Seattle or Bellevue because you know we're expecting to see a lot more folks move in there. The Puget Sound Regional Council then uses these population growths in coordination with the elected officials that are appointed to the Puget Sound Regional Council and uh, regional planning boards to come up with these population growths. So my own city, for example, we have a population growth of, I think it's 25,000 by 2030 or 24,000, and we're supposed to be at that level. If we don't hit that level, then we have to, um, then potentially we could lose our CEPA certification and be unable to issue new building, building permits until uh, we go through that process. So these population targets are, um, they're calculated, they are negotiated as you go through uh, these regions and then enforced through the Growth Management Act. And that's really one of the key issues that's been causing the problems along with the influx of people, which every city on the West Coast has seen, um, but we've seen a lot more because of uh, Microsoft and Amazon and, and some of the other Boeing, uh, other larger companies we have here of large workforces. Um, and so those combination of those two things are probably the, the two biggest things, but we can fix the Growth Management Act. We can't kick everybody out to make more housing, um, but we can fix the Growth Management Act. And there's a couple other things that we can do um, to help that with uh, zoning density and, and so on. And what we're advocating for in this report isn't a doing away with the Growth Management Act. What we're saying is, hey, let's go back. Let's look at these numbers again. COVID changed a lot of different things. COVID changed not just the number of people living here, but the commute patterns of people. And let's maybe adjust some of those boundaries, being sensitive to sensitive areas like agricultural areas and forests and whatnot. But we want to... We, what, what's happening right now is is insane as far as our housing costs. And if we don't change the GMA, we're just going to see this continue uh, for the next few years. So based on what you've said there, it sounds like the Puget Sound uh, Regional Council has a lot of the control to determine what kinds of, you know, allowances there are for building new, new homes. So is there any allowance for local control or is this pretty much done away with as far as, you know, letting a city make its own determination to say, look, we want affordable housing here. We're going to issue more permits. Or is that entirely controlled by the GMA and, and the Puget Sound Regional Council? Well, the PSRC and the GMA control the population growth in, within your cities or at least the, the target density numbers. So you can imagine if you're a city like Edmonds or Marcantillo or Shoreline, where you've effectively reached the limit of where you can go because they're butting up against another city on their borders. And and then the GMA comes in and says, you must add an additional 10,000 residents in the next 10 years. Then what you're forced to do as a local municipality is go back and look at your zoning for single family homes and or uh, multifamily or even mixed use residential homes and up your density, which um, for some cities, they're able to annex surrounding areas and they can then hit their targets. That's the case for Mill Creek. We would be able to annex to the east of us to get to the targets that we need to get to. But for a landlocked city like Edmonds, as an example, that becomes increasingly more difficult and you end up either rezoning and tearing down single family homes and putting in higher density or... or um, well, re really, that's your only option at this point. <laughs> I mean, uh, you know, you see city parks start disappearing and apartments start coming up and you'll see re uh, rebuilds and those types of things. So um, the city does have control right now, although there is legislation passing through the legislature to change this. It does have design review um, and it does have some other control over the type of housing and, and some of the density, depending on if it's eight homes per acre or whether it's one uh, four homes per acre or whatever uh, they're zoned at. And there's also legislation that's moving through the legislature this year that would preempt some of that. It's called middle housing. And that would allow um, a the, a city to effectively upzone particular neighborhoods. So you might find you moved into a single family home neighborhood. You might find that next door you've now got four, four houses that are going to be built there. And so the, that may happen. And there's also legislation about ADUs, which are accessory dwelling units. And this has been in place for a while now that lets you build a small 
home in the back of your property for like a mother-in-law apartment type of thing um, or an Airbnb or a rental unit, which um, there's some debate on use of those, but that helps with the density side of things. But primarily this is being driven by the GMA PSRC. If that didn't exist, you wouldn't have this infill density. But on the flip side, you may see urban sprawl, which was what the GMA was intended to not happen here in Washington. So so then what kinds of changes would you say? Is it mostly just sort of the reevaluation of the, of the population growths that, that we're recommending? Or would you find there are other changes we can make to the GMA to help stave off, you know, L.A. style spread while allowing for, for better fixes for density and things like that? Yeah. So that's that's kind of what I'm saying is it, it, let's not throw let's not throw the baby out with the bathwater. Let's figure out how to um, adjust some of these borders. Um, let's look at uh, the way in which we're paying for infrastructure. You'll notice if you've driven a car in the last 20 years in this area, the traffic sucks. So um, that's a technical term as well. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but the 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 reason for that is because of the GMA isn't uh, requiring uh, urban uh, infrastructure improvements. So one of the things that we've been talking about is, hey, maybe it's time we add a lane to 4 or 5 and I-5 just to get things moving. Because as you increase the density, if I increase the density in Everett, Mill Creek, or South Snohomish County, uh, and I work in Seattle, I've still got to get to Seattle. It doesn't matter if you increase the density. Um that those roads need to happen. Right now, we spend a lot of our uh, mitigation dollars during development on different things that are focused locally. Locally, and one of the efforts, as you know, as a legislature uh, back in uh, a few years back, one of the things that I was working on was a um, a proposal around uh, a regional traffic mitigation strategy when we build new buildings. So, if you build 300 new apartments, those cars don't vanish when they get out on the highway. They go someplace. And so I was trying to get the agencies in this particular case, uh, for those that are familiar with you, it's 132nd, 128th in South Snohomish County. Um, That's washed out the city of Everett, the city of Mill Creek, and Snohomish County. You've got four agencies trying to work with each other. So there's things we can do there. The other things we can do to help with affordability is um, not pass really dumb stuff like banning natural gas in houses. Again, another technical term. I mean... For the state to come in and say we can't build new homes and we can't build commercial homes using that natural gas uh, increases the cost of the home significantly when that happens. And and if you live in an area where you suffer from electricity cutoffs on a frequent basis, electricity cuts, um, weather-related issues, uh, you can't even heat your home or cook anything anymore if you don't have natural gas. And propane's next. you got to believe it. They're going to be coming after that. So folks in eastern Washington that think, hey, I'm good, I'm on a propane tank, yeah, that, that may be uh, an issue for you in the future. And if you've already got some natural gas or propane, where does that look in 10 years, 15 years when you have to replace your stove and, and whatnot? What new regulations is the state going to bring in in the future? So things like that will drive up the cost. Um, rent control drives up the cost of housing in our state. And uh, also um, background checks as well. There's a there's an effort right now to consolidate background checks, which on the face of it looks okay. But when you dig into it, you find out that um, a landlord is unable to do a background check on whoever's moving in to the extent that he should be or she is should be able to. And you end up potentially running to a, a, an individual that may be not quite so savory. Yeah. So I, I was going to say, there's a lot to unpack there and we'll, we'll dive deeper in. But just as a reminder, if you have any questions, feel free to use the Q&A function in the chat. There, there's a chat box as well as a Q&A one. If you use that question and answer box, uh, we'll try to get to any questions that you guys have. Um, so so let's talk, Let you know, like you mentioned a lot of issues there. Let's let's talk about specifically sort of some of these permitting and, and regulation type type issues. So, um, you know, when you're talking about different regulations like the, the gas uh you know, natural gas banning permit or uh, regulations that would prevent you from doing background checks. Is there a single sort of thought process that you can guide legislators or other policymakers to, to help them identify what unintended consequences there might be? Are there any ways to help identify, like, is this regulation ultimately going to drive up the cost instead of trying to, you know, solve whatever problem it's seeking to address? Because, because a lot of the times, a lot of these issues, they seem to have competing priorities, right? The the opportunity cost trade-off isn't being fully considered when you see, say, something like 
oh, we want to ban natural gas for environmental reasons. And then on the other hand, say, we also want to create affordable housing. Those two things come into direct conflict. Are there any, I don't know, is there sort of a red flag you see in a lot of these kinds of regulations that can help people uh, steer away from things that are going to add expense to to the housing side? Yeah, I mean, you, you just nailed it there with the, the natural gas thing. What's the balance here, you know? Uh, if if you ban natural gas, the cost of housing will go up. Therefore, you've got less affordability on the housing. There's an initiative right now, a piece of legislation right now, sponsored by uh, Representative Chop, that um, adds uh, it changes the uh, the tiering on REIT taxes, which is the taxes you pay when you buy and sell a home, and it increases one of the upper bands that's over five million by one percent. And you might think, well, you know, well, my house isn't $5 million, so I really don't care. Um, but what you need to understand is the majority of the homes that cost over $5 million are duplexes and multifamily housing and commercial as well. Don't forget that side of things when commercial gets sold. So a 1% increase there is going to get passed on in the form of increased rents and taxes for homes and, and commercial buildings when those buildings sell. And so the the property owner that owns that duplex is looking at this. And I spoke to several um, commercial and, and residential developers, and they look at it and say, "Well, I'm not eating one percent of the cost of the of the construction of my building. I'm going to pass that on, uh, that tax on to the consumer." So the very emphasis of this bill is to to make affordable housing um, housing more affordable, and yet it does exactly the opposite because. The, the money's got to come from somewhere. So you'll see bills come through the legislature that are tagged as affordable housing, and yet they do absolutely nothing. Uh, the question is, is the government in the way, and, and where's the money coming from? Um, so when you look at permitting, which you also mentioned as well, you know the cost of permitting can be um, extravagant or it, 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 you know, out of control in many cases, King County is significantly more than say Kittitas County in Eastern Washington by a factor of 10 in some cases. And so when you see a permit to do planning permission maybe costs $30,000, well, that developer is not going to go, well, that's great. I have the kindness of my heart. I'm going to write a check for $30,000 to King County government. No, they're going to put that into the cost of the house. And so these permits that you see come through and sometimes multiple permits, particularly with environmental review for multifamily housing, um, uh, they, in their case, they end up having to pay two or three times sometimes for some of these permits. Um, I actually went through a well permit myself a couple of years ago. There were three permits I had to get in sequential order, and it cost me thousands of dollars just to draw water out of an existing well that was in use that was on my property. And so when you look at that and you start thinking about, well, that's the cost of of getting that out, that gets added to the cost of the, the home construction. If the state can get out of the way, it can streamline these permits. It can say, you know what, um, we're going to, uh, one thing, very easy thing they could be doing is if the permit's not approved within 30, 60, 90 days, whatever the, the time period is, that you don't pay for the permit. We automatically just approve it. So there's things like that they can be doing because these permit processes also take a huge amount of time. So if you're a developer and you're applying for a multifamily unit house permit and uh, the state sits on it for six months or the county sits on it for six months, well, you've just invested a bunch of money into this land and the construction that you may be paying interest on. That interest is going to get rolled into the cost of the house. So uh, there's things like that we can do. Simple things. They could pass it this year and we would see an immediate effect. That's what we want to see. And that's what this um, particular uh, study was all about. Yeah, and in this study, one of the one of the things on permits and, and regulations you brought up is that the the fee permit um, book for you know list of fees for, for these different permits was I think sixty pages long. I believe is what you were saying. And there's an example of a vacancy fee, something like that. Do do you want to highlight that just because it's a kind of a funny anecdote? And this yeah, there's a to- total number of fees and things. Yeah, and this is the Seattle um, permitting, yeah, the Seattle per- permitting. I'm not the statewide, but yeah, there's literally a permit to board up your property. So if you've abandoned your property because you couldn't afford your permits anymore, you have to get a permit to board up your actual property, which is uh, that's ridiculous. I mean, if you think about it, I mean, really board the property up and just let them know you did it if you really want to get that far. But why does the state even know you need to, you know, a city need to know that even? 
So you, you see that, and then you wouldn't have even known that unless you spent a two days of your life reading 700 pages or 60 pages or whatever it is of permit, um, permit requirements in the city itself. And then there's all the potential litigation you can get into when you forget that you didn't apply for permit 18713 that's covered with a TPS cover sheet. Yeah, and and something that I think you've highlighted, I don't I don't know if it's highlighted in the study, but you've highlighted in different speaking gigs in the past is going through that those permits just just to look through to what you that that is a cost in and of itself, right? Because you know taking time to do that, either you're an individual and you have to be doing that on your own time, which is a, a cost in a sense, or if you're a business for commercial or or something like that, you have to have someone pay them to do that as well. So all of these little things, even though they seem silly or, or minute. In the short term, they add up and add these kinds of costs, and especially when these these fees, like the one that we listed there from Seattle about boarding it up, I think it's I think you said it was like two hundred and seventy one dollars for that fee, something like that. Again, maybe that's small in the eyes of a total house cost, but that's going to disproportionately impact people who need affordable housing to begin with. Uh, so the lower little fees like that chip away at the very idea of affordable housing, which I think is kind of kind of sad. Um, one other thing uh, I think we should talk about, but again, not directly in this study, but you wrote about it. There's a, another kind of bill with these unintended consequences for for prices uh, has to do with rent costs and rent control. Uh, there's a bill, and I be- and you can correct me if I'm if I'm inaccurate here, but I believe it would uh, make it so that if a landlord wants to raise a tenant's rent more than five percent, they have to declare that six months in advance. Is that is that right? Yeah, that's right. So um, today and. Let's put the background of inflationary pressure right now, and we're saying, you know, depending on who you talk to, which business sector or which sector of the economy you're looking at, it could be as high as 10, 12, 30 percent. So you're you're a property owner, you're renting your house to somebody down the street. You maybe even have rented it to them at a lower rate because you wanted to help with affordable housing. And this law, should it pass, um, and I believe it's uh, strong uh, Representative Peterson that's uh, introduced it. Um, would require you to notify your tenants six months in advance that you were going to increase the rent more than 5% at the end of their lease, which would then allow the tenant to walk away from the lease with no penalty if they show shoes, if you fail to notify them. If you did tell them it's going above 5%, they can still walk away. If you fail to tell them, they can now sue you for triple damages. And so what incentive do you have as a property owner to make it easy for folks to get in you don't and in fact what that will do is that more people will say you know what i'm done i just i'm just going to sell the property and we and and not deal with this rental problem anymore because it's making it so hard well that property then comes off the market because what we're seeing as a rental property and it moves either into housing um for purchase or investment we've seen a lot of people because of our somewhat stable that we've seen it drop in the last few months property market here, uh, we see a lot of foreign investors and out-of-state investors buying up homes and sitting on them looking for that appreciation and value. So that is no longer on the market either. Um, and so you you end up with, again, demand and supply issues. And so things like this, where they're, they're, they're saying it's supposed to be for renter protection, but the majority of these rental agreements are between individuals. It's, it's not a corporation. And um, it just messes with the whole um, demand and supply, the infrastructure, uh, the uh, eco ecosphere, if you like, of rental, and again, will force up rent prices because you, as a landlord, either will pull out or you'll have to increase rents to mitigate the risk that somebody's going to walk away from your lease six months into it with no penalty. That yeah, that it seems to me that this is a bill that is really trying to help out renters and just ends up giving either more power to landlords in the sense that they'll just not renew leases for for renters, right? They'll just raise yeah. prices up and then people have to leave and the prices across the board are going to have raised because everyone will have let their renters go to raise yeah. prices, right? So it, so if you I mean just put yourself um in the position of the the property owner if yeah, you know, assuming he's a person that just wants actually to make money on the property, go figure. Um, he's going to look at it and go, well, I've got to increase my rent by, say, 8%. If I notify the the current tenant, they're going to either walk from my lease and I'm going to end up with two or three months of unrented property. They're going to get mad um, and sue me, potentially, if I don't do it right. Um, so what am I going to do? I'm just going to let the thing run 12 months. I'll get ready for 
another uh, tenant, I'll start advertising again, and then I'll put the 8% on the next tenant. That's exactly what's going to happen. And, and landlords across the board will do this so that when you, you know, leave, oh, I'm not, you know, I can't stay here and for the 8% increase, everyone else will have increased by 8% as well to adjust for inflation. So everyone ends up with a little bit more uh, costly expenses for, for everyone, both landlord and tenant, right? Yeah. Yeah. yeah in the old days, if the, the rent was going to go up, you might want to keep the tenant in, especially if they're a good tenant, because that makes life good for everybody. The tenant doesn't have to move. You don't have to deal with a new tenant as the uh, property owner. But in this case, you're starting to see some significant amount of money. It's going to happen. Yeah. I, I And just to speak from personal experience, you know, I, I rented a house with a couple other guys. There were, there were three, four of us total. And we all went in and rented a, a house and we formed a great relationship with our landlady. And, you know, she increased our, our rent by very minimal margins every day. I think we renewed like three times or something like that. And she, because we were responsible, we cleaned up, we were good communication and that was worth it for her. Even as, you know, inflation was increasing, just the, the general margins he was making was worth it. But now there's, there's no incentive for that to keep happening because, right. uh, you, you can't, when you need to raise rents to, a, to adjust for certain things, you, you have no flexibility as the landlord. So you can't keep good tenants like that. There's, there's not an incentive to keep people uh, in a good relationship like that. Yeah, that's right. Well, thank you so much, Mark. Um, we've got like kind of two questions. One um, that I'm going to sort of paraphrase and and they kind of are related. So I'll kind of lump them in together. So one person is is asking when it comes to sort of the Growth Management Act and we're, we're talking about density and um, whether or not, you know, how, how are we supposed to balance the idea of private property rights with trying to control other people's, you know, density for growth and, you know, neighbor building uh, on that property and say they, they build a, a duplex or, or even, you know, multifamily housing or something like that. You know, how do we balance property rights with with sort of zoning law type things? And then a more specific example here, which, again, is somewhat similar concern for well, a related concern. So someone's talking how they're from North Clark County and uh, they have just lifted the growth boundary. So there's a flood of permits for developing um, what were large properties into developments. They're putting in apartment complex. Uh, apartment complexes, high density housing, etc. And uh, the roads nearby are supposed to convert from a two lane country road to four lanes with roundabouts instead of stop signs or lights. So and then this person's wondering, is there anything that can be done to reduce concentration like that? Or is that just part of sort of the inevitable rise of increased housing and things like that? Well, I'll answer the second question first. Um, and it's back to kind of what I was saying about the PSRC population growth targets. Um, it, it's an artificial uh, target in many cases, you know, Salton as a city, Arlington as a city, and up, you know, up in Clark County, um, they they will set a specific goal for a city. Now that city might be able to trade some of those numbers with a local city, and that's part of the negotiation. But when you've got a small city that's required to add a, a number of people, uh, and they've got limited growth boundaries, the urban growth areas are fixed. What you see is this infill increase in density, and in in the case of the example that was cited there, uh, I'm not familiar with the the boundary removal there, but um, immediately, obviously, the the um, the city zoned it to get their density numbers up so that they don't have to go back and remove single family homes. So the and and they're thinking long term. Um, Mill Creek's done something similar. It's put um, most of its high density along the 527 and 132nd corridor, so we have a lot of apartments. So we can meet those goals, but eventually the day will come when there's no more room. So that's that's really the issue here: is the popul population growth on um, that's coming in for infill, and some of these are artificial, is driving these density decisions. And that's what we need to go back to um, looking at: is reducing some of these goals because it's driving bad decisions. I think on zoning requirements, and then. We can look at um, you're seeing a lot of these downtown cores redeveloping to to get more density in there and let it happen naturally. That as folks move into the area, they will be attracted to that, and you'll have people who want to live in these higher density areas. Excuse me, um, when they're younger and they're and they're starting family before they buy a house. Um, on the uh, respect of property rights, um, and that's partially what the GMA has 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 uh, put a limit on. Um, is you may have bought land thinking that you're going to develop it in the 1970s, and then suddenly in 1990, you were zoned out of an urban growth area. And so um, I think a combination of the population changes and 
some growth of the urban growth areas between the cities. Um, we've got a lot of, they call them donut holes, which are gaps between cities uh, that are county. Um, those can be redeveloped um, with the right infrastructure. Um, and I'm not talking about urban clusters. I'm just talking about just adding some single family homes because as much as the urban planners want us all to live in 10 story Soviet style blocks to get our population numbers correct, most of us want to live in nice neighborhoods and, and homes and maybe retire into apartments or start in apartments and condos, uh, depending on what we're doing in our needs. So we need a mixture of houses, both single family with um, more rural lots and um, housing lots. And we need the high density stuff too, but put those in the urban cores to do that. But in order to do that, we've got to relax some of this uh, urban growth area around our cities to allow some development to to go on there and allow property owners to sell and use their properties as they want. Absolutely. Well, we're just out of time for the, this housing discussion, so we're going to move to education. So thank you so much, Mark, for being with us here. And if you want to read that study again, it is on our website, washingtonpolicy.org. The full study is there. And if you go to the blog, there are some other posts about it that take some snippets of that if you don't have the time to read the full study, which all are very good. Highly recommend. Thanks again, Mark. At. Okay, and so now we are going to talk with Leave Finna. Thanks for being with us, Leave. Uh, we've got a, a little minor issue about education. I, I'm not sure if a lot of people have heard that in the news or not. Um, you have just published a study on six myths of school choice. Uh, first of all, do you want to give us a little bit of context about school choice just in the news? Because it's it's a headline right now in a lot of places. What's what's the momentum looking like? Well, it's it's amazing what's going on across the nation, um, and I think it's in reaction to the school shutdowns during COVID. That you know the bloom is off the rose of public education, and uh, just in the month of January alone, the state of Iowa passed a universal school choice education savings account bill to let ev anyone in the state access an education savings account with I think seven thousand dollars to use on the education of their child, homeschool or private school even private religious schools. That's in Iowa. It's also happened in Utah. And that builds on what happened last summer, Arizona passed a universal school choice bill. And then the year before that, West Virginia, this, remember, notice this is all within the time frame after the COVID school shutdown. It reflects the polls, which show huge growth in support for school choice across the country of, in every demographic group. Now, 72% of the nation supports the notion of giving families direct resources so they can educate their children as they see fit, including private schools. And this is true in every group. You're talking. I have it in my new study. 70% uh, of Black uh, respondents to a poll say they support school choice. 77% of Latinos. Uh, large majorities of Republicans, 82%. Clear majorities of Independents, 67%. And 68% of Democrats support school choice. So. This is the wave of the future. It's spreading across the nation, uh, and it, it can't even avoid the shores of Washington State. But of course, we have people very powerful here that that do not want it, um, do not want to give families opportunities for ch uh, directing the education of their children. And so, I thought it would be helpful uh, to write up in this policy brief just responses to, to the common objections that that you often hear. For sure. Yeah. So so before we get into maybe some of the specific, w let's define our terms a little bit. What would you say is the best way to define when a state sort of has crossed the threshold for school choice? Because I think school choice can mean a lot of things. Um, you know, you could be talking about school choice within public schools, being able to choose which public school you go to. It could be uh, something like an education savings account. It could be charter schools. What do you what do you think um, as far as uh, school choice? Where, where, where do you say is a good line for that? Well, uh, there is a parent power index that the Center for Education Reform has posted online, and it grades every state in the nation uh, based on its giving families access to charter schools. Choice being choice. Basically, the concept is that a parent can decide which school their child attends. Now, in public education, most children are assigned by zip code to their local public school. There are... Um, all kinds of ways that have been tried across the nation to give parents some options to this forced assignment to their local neighborhood school, because often that school does not meet the needs of their child. 
And who knows better than a parent uh, what the needs of that their individual child is? So, so policymakers are hearing parents loud and clear. So, uh, I'll I'll describe the range of, of options. One very limited one, which we have in Washington State, but is heavily regulated and controlled from by districts, and that is to allow parents to go outside their local school district boundaries. But they have to go through a bureaucratic system, show that there's a room in the, in the district they want to go to. It's very difficult to achieve. So it's, it's not essentially a real uh, power. Uh, there's there's public, another form. So so I, I discount that as a very meaningful option. Um, there are options in some districts to, like uh, Lake Washington School District has some options that you can apply to, to particular schools. Uh, but they, again, these are limited to, uh, and not every family gets to go to the school they want to. Uh, and so it, so so in the public system, these options are very highly regulated up to the whim of the local district uh, central planners and really don't give parents much power. So what I think is exciting in other states are these real school choice options, which give parents control over a portion of the money that the state provides for their education. It is their education money. Let's let's think of it that way. And giving parents that direct resource. Now, there are, form, there are different forms of doing that. There are vouchers. That's one way. You just give a parent a voucher for the, in Washington state, it would be, we're now spending $18,000 per student. You would give, a, um, from all resources of funding, you would give a parent a, a voucher to a private school uh, worth eighteen thousand dollars, and that voucher could transfer to pay the tuition. That, that could be done that way. There's tax credit scholarships, which is another a way of doing this, and that is you create a, a, a tax a scholarship granting institution that, uh, and the state gives uh, businesses and families tax credits towards giving money to these scholarship granting institutions, and then that in institution gives out scholarships. That's sort of a, a way to get around some of the previous obstacles. So, so that's that's another form. And, but now the most cutting edge form and clearest and best, I think, to understand is to give families a credit card with called an education savings account with the money the state provides so that that money can be used on these private options for education, including homeschooling. So that is what's taking fire across the nation. There's 10 states that already provide um, education savings accounts to targeted uh, groups of students, like uh, special needs kids, kids assigned to failing schools, military kids, and so forth. But what's, what's broken out now since COVID is a form of an education account that is not just targeted to some deserving group of students, but is universal universal education savings accounts. And these would be overseen, you know, by regulatory, make sure that you're not running off. They're, they're, they are audited by the state treasurers typically to make sure that the money is spent on only education purposes. And, and that's done with health savings accounts and other types of things. Yes, so it's a very common way to do it. So that's that. I hope that covers <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. And, and you've written um, a, a legislative memo on a bill that would set up um, education savings accounts in Washington state. So if anyone wants to read uh, about a specific proposal that's that's in Washington right now um, in the legislature, go to, go to our site, washingtonpolicy.org. We have the the study there. Uh, a question from um, from one of our uh, listeners and watchers right now is asking uh, what if there are uh, Washington organizations that are actively lobbying for these efforts in support of and you know any any groups sort of advocating on, uh, for these kinds of reforms. Yes, there are groups forming uh well, so there was this bill, as you mentioned, House Bill 1633, that got a hearing in the House Education Committee. And there were strong supporters uh, that t came forward to testify and support. In addition to us, uh, there is uh, a fellow named Quentin Oram, who is uh, an advocate for school choice. And he has a group that is pursuing helping that happen. That There's a group, the uh, Washington Federation of Independent Schools supports school choice. And um, there, and now with the advent of some, um, you know, opposition to what's actually being taught in the traditional public schools, the uh, groups like Conservative Ladies of Washington, uh, women, uh, no, there's so many groups now that are forming. I can't remember all their names, but um, a good problem to have, I suppose. <laughs> yes, it's good. It's super good. It's super good. And and uh, so, uh, yes, the, the the idea. It's so amazing when an idea like this comes out and people start talking about it and thinking about it and you hear the word fund the student, not the system, that 
actually takes care of a lot of the arguments, the falsehoods that are that are being um, put forward as reasons why we shouldn't have it. Because if you start thinking about what is the purpose of education, I is it to create a whole bureaucratic system that where you have a lot of people on public salaries that are delivering, you know, sort of mediocre results, or is it to educate the children in the schools to the highest level possible? You start thinking of it that way, then then the solution is very obvious. You, you giving parents power is clearly necessary, uh, and that would, and you know, of course, the research is showing this. There are uh, empirical studies showing that when you have enough school choice in in uh, you know get to a certain uh, percentage of market share, enough pressure uh, put, is put on the established bureaucracies and monopolies of delivering public education. They, in order to keep their funding will start work uh, working on an in internal improvements uh, so that they don't lose their families to school choice. So it's actually a form of improving the public system, which has been proven stubbornly resistant to change. And we've had 40 years of efforts, top-down efforts, to improve the public school system. And and everyone understands the sort of basic rationality of, you know, let's make them compete a little. But, you know, when you have a, a guaranteed income stream, you have very little incentive to do anything better. You don't have any incentive, certainly, to get rid of a bad teacher or or to improve a program that isn't getting the results, the promised results. And so when you have parents saying, I'm getting up, I've had it, you know, 4,700 families have pulled their kids out of Seattle Public Schools, Donald. That's 8.4%. The Seattle Times just came out with a great article. It's called Seattle Public Schools Create Chaos Instead of Community. That is a great article because they are now saying that well i was very pleased because because they have understood what we've been saying for years that the that parents are powerless in the system that there's this whole game being played with with uh, giving out pay raises that are not affordable and et cetera, et cetera. but but what they say at the bottom of this article is that that seattle public schools is not interested in the families that are leaving why nobody knows why nobody's interested in asking them why <laughs> and so it's clear that they're not customer friendly every you talk to any private business and they all they think about is what makes their customers happy you know how do we keep these people here we need their money we need to make them happy and that that is a a, a uh, culture that is not the culture of public education and that's what we need to get to and so i'm super excited about this universal school choice sweeping the nation i mean Right now, I mean, this is the most worse on in education. And that's, of course, I love this subject. <laughs> However, <laughs> right now, right now, the state of Texas is considering a universal school choice bill. Right now, the state of, of Florida is considering a school choice bill. Florida opens its legislative session in a couple of weeks. These are big states. These are big ideas. And they are, and I heard yesterday on, on TV, Steve Forbes at the publishing industry, the leader of the publishing, you know, complex. He's talking about school choice. Everyone's talking about it, and I, I just can't believe this is, time has come here. So, you know, here in Washington State, of course, we have obstacles to school choice, and they're political, but not not rational ones. So, so let's talk about these. Yeah, what to say. Let's talk I'm, about what to say. Absolutely, I was going to say. So, I think you know, I, I actually really like you. You sort of addressed one of the of the common myths i think where, where you talk about how it how it does help public schools and that they have an incentive to compete and to provide you know a, a better service for the students and the parents but one of the common objections is that in creating these different school choice programs and diverting funding and students you you deprive these public schools of resources that they need in order to send them to private school kids what what what's sort of your your response to that uh, fairly common line of, of concern Yes, that's just a fear-mongering line that is just not true, okay? So just think about it. These education savings accounts don't give the full $18,000. They always give something less, and it's usually just the state portion, okay? So the $18,000 in Washington State is made up of about $12,500 from the state, uh, another uh, $2,000 from the federal government, and then the balance from local levies. So we're just talking about the state portion. And only 90% of the state portion, and that House Bill 1633, that's all it was, 90% of the state portion, about $11,000 per child. So that leaves the remaining, what is that, $7,000 to educate the children that are left in the public school. So, so when a child leaves, that child does not need to be educated, and a portion of his money stays. So it's actually a way to give more money to the public schools. Let 
the child leave with part of his funds and let the rest of his funds stay. So, so if you just look at the dollars, it's clear that that's just not true. Uh, but then you have to think again about the philosophy of this. Is this, what is the purpose of public education? Is it to, to protect the system of public schools and let them get more money for educating fewer children every year? I mean, really, we cannot, we cannot proceed on that basis. Uh, the schools can adjust their spending, they have fewer students, and they should be. That's, they're the stewards of public dollars. And uh, there's just no rationale for this argument. The other point that I looked into on this, this is the biggest argument that they make. So I looked to see if it was actually true that the remaining public schools actually receive less money if you create a school choice program. And in fact, they don't. I mean, they get more money every month, every year. They every The state lawmakers always give more money to tra traditional public schools. Creating a school choice program does not mean that less goes to the to the traditional public school system. In fact, quite the contrary, more money goes to public schools. So this is just a falsehood and and should be uh, just dismissed uh, by supporters of school choice and just think, well, what, it, what are you trying to do here? Are you trying to help the system? Are you trying to help the student? Or are you trying to protect the funding of the system? You know, uh, to, to shill for another one of your publications, you, you also put out a publication that showed five uh, charts on the spending trends of public schools and how much the state has has poured into the into the different you know metrics you can measure that with and in discussions i've had with people who are skeptical of school choice or are generally very pro spending more on public education you know i'll i'll bring up the fact that we have spent more on education every year it keeps increasing and and a lot of their their responses have been historically well you know we're getting more students so we have more resources we have to spend on and and one, your charts show that spending per student has increased, so that doesn't add up there. But second, something like this school choice would completely defeat that argument because they would be getting funding for students that don't attend. Like you mentioned, they're getting about seven thousand for people who don't attend. So it should be a win-win, really, uh, when you when you think about it that way, because they are still getting uh, funding for for students who aren't aren't in attendance there. Uh, another another question I do want to address um, that people bring up is that it, this school choice uh, would violate separation of church and state because you could subsidize religious schools and religious institutions with taxpayer and government funds. Um, is there a response that you have uh, to that objection um, is as far as the resource transfer to, to religious schools goes? Oh, I'm not sure we may have lost Leave's connection here. So I, I think we'll, we'll talk a little bit about that, but uh, in in the there was a, a Supreme Court case that happened, a state Supreme Court or a, a case that ha happened that affects Washington, a Supreme Court case that overturned a lot of that religious discrimination against funding for uh, these religious schools. So there were there was a case that ruled essentially that laws like uh, the Blaine amendments that happened in Washington that prevented any kind of education resources to going in for, from going into religious schools, that those were actually unconstitutional because uh, parents should have the right to express, uh, you know, their religious inclinations for their for their students, uh, where whichever schooling options they want. So while uh, Washington doesn't currently have a school choice program that would allow this type of thing, although the education savings account that um, uh, is being proposed would fit into that, while it doesn't currently have that, these Blaine amendments are effectively struck down null and void because of the Supreme Court ruling on this issue. Um, unfortunately, it seems like Leave has has dropped off. We'll, we'll give her a second to see if she can re reconnect. Um, if not, we will we'll wrap up a little early. And as a reminder, though, if you want to watch this, uh, this video or catch up uh, on any of our other ones, these are all uploaded to our YouTube channel at Washington Policy Center on YouTube. We also upload these episodes as a podcast, so you can catch it um, through your favorite podcast platform. Washington Policy on the go is where you can catch those. Um, if we don't have time to get your question, if Leave isn't able to get back up, I'll, I'll make sure to send these to her so that she can hopefully uh, get back to you guys uh, on those through email. Um, and so if you have, uh, if you want to leave uh, any sort of way to contact, we'll, we'll try to get back to you guys on that. Um, so yeah, unfortunately, it doesn't seem like she's here now. So we're gonna wrap up a little early. Um, again, check out her publication on this for for more of these myths and more of uh, the responses to refute them. Thank you guys so much for attending uh, this episode of Washington Policy on the Go, and we'll see you next week.